Um, I think I'm going to sit here and stay here. Uh, you can all hear me, I hope. Um, I'm, I will try um, not to make you cry <laughs> today. I, I have no intention of making you cry. Um, uh, I should perhaps start by saying that um, I come from a very different place, as you can Sir David, uh, or Chris, or Andrew, I am uh, essentially an outsider. Uh, Chris Frangel obviously was asked by my wife to write uh, his book about his history um, and has had dealings with it over the years. I sadly failed to have any dealings with my wife during the course of my writing, my life for the point. I kept writing to them every year and saying, may I have a briefing please? I know that you could give me a briefing if you wanted to. And they would write back and say, no. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, anyway, so, uh, so I'm very much out of that loop. Um, but as an outsider, uh, I think that uh, in the course of researching my book about Anthony Blunt, um, uh, I was able to get a, a sort of quite an interestingly wide perspective, though I have to say it only goes up to about 1970. <laughs> I think it, it draws interesting parallels with the present um, uh, about the sorts of mistakes, uh, the sorts of scrapes. Uh, the sorts of things that can go wrong in intelligence services. Uh, and what I see as an outsider, which is I'm sure what lots of people, lots of the public see, is that um, intelligence services can some seem not exactly perhaps stupid, but, but to outsiders it can sometimes look like that, but uh, obtuse, inward looking, consumed by certain ego fixes. Um, all institutions, especially government institutions, have a tendency to become stuck or fossilised. Um, unless they're continually renewed and reappraised. The problem is, of course, uh, more marked with intelligence organisations because they are by their nature secret, and that makes them much harder to appraise and to examine, to criticise, uh, and perhaps harder to correct problems when they go wrong. Uh, the secrecy of which they're shrouded gives them more autonomy uh, from authority than other instruments of state uh, and tends to make this much worse. Uh, there's a rather good quote from uh, the horse historian Lord Acton, who in the middle of the 19th century said, everything secret degenerates, nothing is safe that does not show how it can bear discussion and publicity. Um, I think it's very interesting that we're right in the middle of Chilcot, you know, I think this is something that does afford a possible, you know, potential for us to sort of completely reappraise what, well, I hope it will, I'm not sure if it actually will, but it certainly seems, seems very timely. Um, and it certainly can be, can be and has been true of different intelligence services uh, that, um, that things go wrong and things are too secret um, and intelligence services can become not fit for purpose. There's a very good American intelligence writer called Tom Powers who, uh, who wrote a few years ago that uh, a very plausible history of the CIA could be written entirely through its cock-ups and mistakes and submission to a series of White House names. Um, from the, what, what is now often described as the uh, threat inflation uh, of, of the Soviet menace in the 1950s uh, in the creation of what some American historians now call um, an imaginary Russia, um, said to be posing a terrifying threat that was much greater than reality, um, to, uh, through plots to topple Fidel Castro, uh, through uh, dangerous drug experiments on unsuspecting human guinea pigs, uh, through training South American death squads, um, uh, through uh, you know um, failing to deal with a series of conflicts and problems from the invasion of North Korea to the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, to the non uh, of a whole series of a couple of very significant moles in the 1970s, 80s, and early 90s. Um, I mean that's often sort of comedy history. Obviously, obviously we don't hear about about the successes. Um, but we can only go on, on what we know. Um, and it seemed to me, uh, looking, I'm going back to my work on Anthony Blunt uh, and uh, his involvement uh, in the security services and then <coughs> he was a member of MI5 during the war, I don't know if all of you know, uh, it, he, he worked in MI5 uh, and at the same time he was of course a Soviet spy. He was handing over pretty much everything that came across his desk to uh, the Soviets. He left MI5 in 1945. Uh, uh, in 1951, his friend Guy Burgess and the uh, other Soviet spy, Don McLean, fled to Russia. And um, a 
lot of people in the security services thought that he was probably involved, but it was another uh, 13 years before really anything was done about it. Uh, and uh, then a confession was made because an uh, American uh, who'd been recruited by Grant in the 30s came forward, said he had a bit of evidence. He was then uh, he was uh, persuaded to make a confession, and the confession was then kept secret from the general public until 1979. So, you know, there was during this process, uh, um, uh, as you can imagine, a long period of obfuscation, secrecy, and all sorts of interesting things happened that really sort of shouldn't have happened in security services, and not just in British intelligence, but also in Russia and in America at the same time. And this made me reflect. On, on, uh, on the fact that there are some series, you can sort of categorise some of the things that can go wrong uh, with intelligence services. And one of them, and perhaps it's something that we can see if you were at least it's worth discussing whether there are true powers today is caving into political pressure uh, when the intelligence services become too much the creature of a political leader or diverted from pure intelligence gathering to interpreting information in a way that pleases its political master. Um, and there's a very good example of this uh, in Russian intelligence during the Second World War. Uh, it misused and ignored all kinds of vital and important intelligence information, especially over the German invasion of 1941. Um, in fact, Russian intelligence was getting reports from all over the world, from Japan, from England, from Germany, uh, people were saying, you know, the Germans are coming, the Germans are coming, the tanks are coming to the border. And uh, these warnings were systematically uh, ignored, basically because Stalin did not believe that Hitler was going to break the Soviet Nazi pact. Nazi pact. And um, the uh, heads of uh, Soviet intelligence uh, were completely sort of suffused with the, the sort of, well, you know, they were in many respects creatures uh, of Stalin. They, they were um, very much caught up in the political mentality at the time. And uh, basically what happened was the Germans rolled over the border and they were in Kiev before you know, the Russians were ready, knew anything about it, despite all that intelligence <coughs> coming in. Um, and then uh, there's another extraordinary example uh, during the middle of the war when Burgess, Blunt, McLean and Philby and the fifth man, John Kenicross, will hand over vast numbers of documents to the, to the Russians. It's extraordinary material. Blunt handed on over the whole Fortitude Plan. Um, he uh, handed over uh, information about the Enigma Code, so the Russians knew all about that, but it was supposed to be a complete secret. Um, and he was the least of them. He, he passed about 1,700 documents, and Burgess passed about 5,000. The Russians were getting the most astonishing information. Um, but they, the Russians decided that it was all too good to be true. These very, very good uh, English agents must be plants because they, uh, they were just, you know, it's too good. And in fact, what it was that, that sort of so that, that Stalin esque and kind of purge paranoia had so saturated uh, Russian intelligence that they just couldn't see anything clearly. And, um, and so. Uh, 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 also, of course, the, the, the uh, British agents were slightly tainted because they'd initially been recruited in the 1930s by uh, a generation of Soviet agents who'd been purged. Uh, and so instead of kind of saying, this is great, this is marvellous information, get us some more, the agents were continually asked to sort of rewrite their autobiographies. And at one point, the Russians sent uh, a team of, um, of sort of keystone cop like uh, <laughs> Russian. Uh, sort of agents in kind of big, very bare skin <coughs> hats around. Can you imagine in London in 1944 going into, into bars and saying, you know, I would like a, a Muyaski, and uh, can you tell me where I'm being, where I'm, you know, am I thriving? You know, I mean, it was hilar both ridiculous, hilarious, and, and preposterous. Um, uh, and so an awful lot of information was clearly wasted. And uh, into the bargain, there were simply not enough analysts and translators at the NKVD, which is the, one of the former old names of the KGB, to look at all the material that the Cambridge spies were sending out. So vast tranches of it were never actually read um, and were, obviously weren't acted on.